Hi yeah. everyone, this is Sue Considine and I'm here with Leah Krause, Margaret Portier, and Meredith Levine. Welcome to the third webinar put on by MSRT, Kyla's newest roundtable focused on making and STEAM learning. This roundtable was started to allow New York State libraries to connect and share knowledge about making and STEAM across all library types and to all types of library staff. There's so much innovation and inspired activity happening in our libraries right now and we think it's a critical time to connect, share, and inspire one another as we move in new directions. You can join MSRT for just dollars when added to an existing NYLA membership. Go to NYLA.org and click on Memberships, then Roundtables to join today. We wanted to start today by sharing some Save the Dates our upcoming, about our upcoming webinars and continuing ed events. Our fourth webinar is called Making the Makerspace and will be held on October 7th from 2 to 3 p.m. It will be an overview to strategies for getting started with the maker movement at your library. Then, on October 21st, we will be leading a day-long pre-conference at NYLA Annual in Lake Placid called So You Want to Make Your Space. This will be a full-day, hands-on workshop that will dive extensively into strategies related to funding, resources, policies, staffing, training, technologies, programs, and more for bringing making to your library. Participants will get a crash course on 3D printing, 3D modeling, electronics, robotics, and more. Registration is now open for this pre-conference session. Go to the NYLA website to register. One of the most important ways you can get involved today with MSRT is to sign and submit the NYLA section petition. Our goal is to make MSRT a section so that we can provide multiple, meaningful, virtual, and on-site connecting and learning opportunities, not only at the annual conference, but throughout the year. Making MSRT a section will allow us to have a seat on NYLA Council so we can move the Making and STEAM agenda forward through libraries across our state. To help make MSRT a section, please go to the NYLA MSRT website and submit the form you'll find there by mail, fax, or email. We also have a brand new opportunity for students to hold an at-large board position with MSRT as our student liaison. The student liaison will play a critical role assisting students in making connections with library professionals particularly interested in making and STEAM in libraries. The student liaison will receive free conference registration for the NYLA Annual Conference in Lake Placid, October 21st through the 24th. Please share this opportunity with any interested students you may know. More info can be found about applying for this on the NYLA MSRT webpage. Thanks, Sue. So now into our program for the day. Today we're going to be starting with an overview on strategies and examples for injecting STEAM into library spaces. We'll then focus on injecting STEAM into library collections and services. And finally, uh, finish with some strategies for injecting STEAM into your existing programs. Starting with our spaces. Most libraries contain common spaces, um, collection spaces, meeting room spaces, and communal spaces like reading rooms or cafes, for instance. So one approach with injecting STEAM into spaces is to start by asking, um, how can we enhance these spaces, making slight additions or changes to them in order to integrate opportunities for STEM learning and interest building? Another approach is to take efforts to identify and repurpose underutilized or duplicative spaces in your library in order to transform these into spaces dedicated to STEAM learning and exploration. And in order to do both of these things, to take both of these strategies, we at the Fayetteville Free Library have found that it's critical to start by asking, what can we stop doing in our spaces and with our resources in order to provide more access to hands-on STEAM learning in the library spaces? So to determine what we can stop doing, assessing our spaces is critical. Have you informally observed that certain areas of your library seem to often be going unused? This could be a closed door space, like maybe a tutoring room or a story time room that no one uses outside of story time hours, or maybe a board room that's only used once a month for board meetings. It could be something as simple as a tucked away corner of your kid's room or a work station or table, a duplicative catalog computer station that sits unused. 
If you have a hunch like this, pick a week or two for staff members or volunteers to more formally observe these suspect areas. They can keep tally of what days of the week and times of day that that room or station or corner is in use and confirm your hunch. And then take the opportunity to ask based on the use that you're seeing, does it continue to make sense to reserve these spaces for their purposes? Or is there elsewhere in the library or community that the activities going on in these spaces could take place? Additionally, are there opportunities to reorganize your floor space more effectively? Can a closet be cleaned out to store items that could be rolled out for STEM clubs and programs? Could a collection be reorganized to open up some wall space or floor space for, say, an iPad kiosk or a STEM material display? We took this very approach at our library. We observed, um, sort of like the examples I just mentioned, that our story time room and our largest teen tutoring room were indeed sitting empty a large percentage of the time. We also noted the potential with these spaces that the activities going on within them could easily happen elsewhere in the library or the community. For instance, with our teen tutoring room, tutoring could happen in our other two small tutoring room spaces or just in our reading room space, as well as many other spaces in the community. We also, with our story time room, noticed the potential that story time could be held elsewhere in the library, such as our community meeting room space. We also observed a few tucked away corners within our collection area, like the back corner of our kids' room that was sort of not visible because of shelving, and nothing was really going on back there. So we said, hey, can we revamp this space to feature STEM learning elements? Having identified some areas of the library where you want to develop STEAM dedicated spaces or add elements to support STEAM learning, it can also be helpful to take a close look at what you can stop doing in regards to your budget to be able to, re to identify and reallocate funds to move in this direction. So particularly, one area we took a close look at was our programming budget. We sort of took a new approach and philosophy to programming where we, we took a critical eye at the types of programs that we were paying for. We noticed that we were often paying for experts, um, one-time performers, and entertainers, uh, and they could be relatively high price tags to get these people to come in and speak or put on their program. We asked ourselves, could we as staff be, be leading these programs at a reduced cost? Could we, um, at the same time, open up the library to our community members? Could they, on a volunteer basis, um, would they be willing to lead classes, clubs, programs, and events that were of similar interest and value to the community? We've had a lot of su success taking that approach, being able to reallocate programming funds towards purchasing technologies, kits, and materials that can be used again and again for STEM programs. Um, so maybe, for instance, instead of spending um, $500 one time for a children's performer to come in and lead a program, we could take that $500 and buy some Lego robotics kits or little bits kits or makey makeys and buy several of them, maybe even, you know, depending on the item, um, many multiple items that could be reused in programs and on a drop-in basis again and again. We also took a close look at some of our other budget lines to think what can, how can we do more STEAM in our, in our spaces. Um, one particular area we looked at was our database budget. We really closely assessed the use of our various databases and really wanted to move away, away from any model where we were renewing um, just sort of out of habit. We wanted to look at, make sure that we were always looking at, does it make sense from a cost per use perspective for our community to subscribe to these databases? Um, are there free resources available out there that we can now direct our community members to through our website instead of databases that we may have paid thousands of dollars for in the past? So this was another area that we we're able to reallocate resources from to be able to do more with STEAM um, technologies in our spaces. So having identified both spaces and resources needed, here are some examples of how we move forward with adding STEAM elements to our existing spaces and creating STEAM dedicated spaces at our library. We've integrated rotating displays on STEAM topics into our collection spaces. 
We've integrated iPad stations throughout our spaces loaded with STEM learning apps. We now feature a pop-up STEAM shop in the library that moves around to different locations each month and features interactive experiments that change every month. We put out STEM learning kits in our cafe space, such as Lego kits, Tames and Cosmos kits, and more. We feature AWE stations in our kids' room that support early literacy and STEM learning. We applied for a grant and got funding to purchase um, a Computers on Wheels unit, which contains 20 laptops, which we store in a closet in our community room and roll out for coding clubs and other technology programs. And similarly, we've stored an AV cart in a closet in our community room that we roll out um, with tools and technologies for STEM learning programs, whether that could mean micro microscopes, laptops, 3D printers, robot kits, etc. These are rolled out into our existing meeting room space on a periodic basis um, and utilized by our community. So one example of a STEAM dedicated space that we were able to develop um, due to reallocating our budget and reallocating our um, spaces is our FFL Creation Lab. So I mentioned that we identified a large team, tut team tutoring room that sat empty most of the time. We converted this space into a digital media lab, which is what we call our Creation Lab. It's a 250 square foot space and it contains all of the technologies that you see on the screen here, including the tools and technologies needed for making and editing photos, graphics, videos, podcasts, webcast, websites, comic strips, video games, and more. So it's a drop-in space, and it's also used um, for many clubs and programs for anybody ranging from kids to adults at the library. So our next space is the FFL family room. So it's a perfect example of an underutilized closed door space that we opened up and added steam elements to. So before, this room was used as a story time room, just a story time room, and it had a desk in it used by a team member. The doors were only open when people were coming in and out of story time. Otherwise, that room was not used. The space was only used for story times and the occasional community meeting. This space was large and very much so underutilized. It was also uninviting with its doors constantly closed. So the team at the FFL began to think together, how can we rethink this space and create a learning space that is accessible for children during all library hours. We wanted a space that was inviting, open, accessible, educational, and fun for families of all ages. We want to create a room just for families. And through meetings and brainstorming, the FFL family room was created. So the family room is an open, inviting space with doors that will never close again. A space with two Wii's with appropriate games kids enjoy, a train table for our younger engineers to have access to whenever they are at the library, allowing them to play and interact with other children while parents can talk and um, mingle. So puzzles, iPads, and a TV where patrons can play their favorite movie or listen to their favorite CD, developing early literacy skills through dance and movement. And finally, you can see the white space on the wall. That's our white wall, where patrons can imagine and create while being on the wall. We do have the occasional spots on the orange, but we can easily clean that off. So this room targets our youngest patrons and introduces them to STEAM, even at the most basic level, like using their imagination drawing on the wall, using technology like apps on the iPad, or just playing with the trains. So the back corner of the children's room was another underutilized space. There were several tables and a few chairs that were seldom used by patrons. The position of the shelving unit that houses our readers also cut off the space and blocked sight lines across the room. In fact, unless they were looking for a specific book, most patrons forgot that this corner existed altogether. At the FFL, we have a vision of libraries as centers of community creation, and we actively foster a culture of making and innovating. This culture should be encouraged and instilled in patrons of all ages. However, a gap in our services left young children without the space and opportunity to participate in maker culture. This space was a perfect opportunity to fill that gap. The Little Makers area is a free play space with a detached program designed to encourage children to imagine, create, and build. The supplies provided in this space help develop critical thinking and STEAM skills. Permanent frames with clothespins and shelves on the wall allow our community's little makers to share their creations with the community. This space also includes an invention box, 
with craft supplies and community donations that children can take and use for their own creations. It also has a Ruminate DIY wire dollhouse building kits, snap circuits, which make learning how to use electronics easy, as you can see in the picture, a Makey Makey, which allows you to become an inventor by alligator clipping the internet to anything like bananas or Play-Doh. There are bionic blocks, an architectural construction and building set, Kaleido gears, which teach children the, sim children, excuse me, the simple principles of mechanics. And finally, Goldie blocks, which offer a story, games, and activities to encourage girls to learn engineering skills. As librarians and educators, we understand the importance of STEAM skills and play in childhood development. So in addition to the free play activities inherent in the space, we have created a series of Little Makers programs. These programs utilize the children's natural curiosity and the power of their imaginations to explore various STEM concepts. It is the emphasis on exploration and free play that make these programs so rewarding. So now we're going to talk about um, injecting STEAM into our collections and services. So in an effort to not only make browsing easier in the library, but to make otherwise not so exciting titles get the exposure they deserve, we adapted a Dewey hybrid model. We moved funds in our collection budgets around to support the push for more nonfiction titles and expanded that section. During that process, we also converted the collections into categories with correlating stickers. We have found collection numbers have risen and children are more interested in reading nonfiction now that the collection is easier to browse. With the bright stickers that were made in-house using Microsoft Word and printed at a local print shop, paired with the bright orange signs, families have a much easier time finding the books they are looking for and discovering new titles along the way. With the push for more nonfiction in schools, we have been conscious of our purchasing and buying titles that support STEAM learning in a fun, engaging way. We have also made sure to purchase titles that pair with what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis in the library. So if we're doing a program on circuits, we have to make sure we have books on circuits to support it. We have also developed a reference collection in our Fab Lab to support making in the library. This collection sits in the Fab Lab space and varies everywhere from knitting and crocheting to Arduino and CAD design. Similar titles have also been added to our adult nonfiction collection as well. So as you have seen, we are actively engaging and supporting families as their child's first teachers in our spaces, programs, and beyond our library's walls. We ensure that families have the information and resources they need to pursue early literacy and STEAM learning at home. We created Born to Read kits that are designed based on the research of every child ready to read. The kits are based around a topic like seasons or transportation and contain three board books, one children's music CD, a toy, and a laminated insert that suggests ex extension activities and tips for reading with your baby. These kits encourage Kits encourage young children to talk, sing, read, write, and play, while explaining to parents why these practices are vital to their children's development. And many of the themes featured in the kits have a STEM focus, like animals or weather. We also offer ready-to-read kits, which similarly emphasize the early literacy skills through three related picture books, often referred to as a story time in a bag. Our early literacy kits are favorites with working parents who may not have the time to attend traditional programming. We also offer a host of information about early literacy on our website so families can learn about best practices without having to leave their homes. We have also created I Am kits for preschoolers that will help think about future career paths. This is an idea that we took away from a conference last year, which we've modified to give it our own spin, a STEM spin. With these kits, children can imagine what it would be like to be a scientist, an engineer, a biologist, and, and more, in addition to the more traditional careers. We also have STEM kits, and these include renewable energy STEM kits. You can build and try hundreds of experiments with wind power, solar power, and hydropower. Electricity and circuit kits. They can learn about electricity and create a functioning circuit with little bits and snap circuits. We have Connects education kits, where anybody can become an engineer. You can build and test bridges, amusement parks, moving vehicles, and more. So finally, our Let's Learn kits allow patrons to explore and create new things and discover new hobbies, such as knitting or crocheting. At the FFL, we're also actively linking new digital technologies to discovery and access through our circulating device collections. The library circulates a collection of iPads, Kindles, and Nooks to our community. The devices come preloaded with the newest bestsellers and the most popular apps. 
Each collection was developed with an audience and the learning goals and needs of that audience in mind. For example, our family engagement iPads are geared towards school-aged children and teens and are loaded with great STEM apps like Guide, Science 360, Scratch, and Daisy the Dinosaur. We also support early learning through our early literacy iPads. We support parents' decisions regarding screen time and we strive to act as media mentors to help families find a balance between new and traditional media forms. Studies have found that the active, appropriate use of technology and media can support and extend traditional materials in valuable ways. Therefore, our early literacy iPads are loaded with librarian-selected content that promote the five early literacy practices, STEM learning, and creative development. The iPads come with an insert that encourages shared parent-child interaction with the device and offers information about the current research on children and new media. We also offer one-on-one -on -one technology assistance to individuals and families to help them learn to utilize these technologies to the fullest. Here it is. <laughs> Sorry, lost my notes. So we also think about the library's computers and the software on them as being a collection that we maintain and curate to support STEM learning as well. Some examples of the software that we load onto our computers for this purpose include Minecraft EDU, which is an educational mod of Minecraft, Tinkercad and SketchUp, which are both free and open source 3D modeling software, the iLife Suite by Mac, which has GarageBand, iPhoto, and iMovie in it for you know, creative digital creation. The Adobe Creative Suite, which is Photoshop and Illustrator and things like that. Audacity, which is a free open source audio editing software. Celestia, which is also a free open source software that lets you explore the universe. Ker Kerbal Space Program, which is um, a computer game designed to help children understand uh, space exploration by creating their own space program from scratch, starting by building rockets and then launching them into space and seeing whether they crash back down to the Earth or, you know, exit the solar system. Kodu Game Lab, which allows kids to create their own computer games, and also STEAM learning programs like lynda.com and Webucator, which allow our patrons to direct their own learning by, you know, giving them access to classes on what they're interested in. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how to inject STEAM into some of the programs that we run in the library. Most public libraries offer some kind of program like story time, craft programs, summer reading events, and book clubs. Um, let's examine these programs similarly to the way that we have examined our spaces and our collections to see if we can find some ways to inject STEAM. Story time can be a powerful experience for young learners. Even before they walk, an effective story time can make a significant impact that will help physical as well as social and emotional development. Story time increases children's social communication and literacy skills and introduces them to the world of STEAM. By exposing these young learners to STEAM subjects at this impressionable age, we are fostering a love to learn that they will carry with them throughout school and throughout their lives. Story time is a very active and tactile experience where we encourage children and parents not just to listen, but to touch, hear, see, feel, and move. We use iPads and story time to incorporate these different types of learning while exposing children and their parents to new technology and the ways it can be utilized for developing pre and early literacy skills, as well as gain a basic understanding of how this technology is used. In digital story times, we model effective use of touchscreen technology in early learning, and this can be as simple as selecting and reading a picture book app in addition to the other print titles that you share. You can also project the words to your hello and goodbye songs and to rhymes that you use to encourage hesitant parents to participate in the fun. We've also made concentrated efforts to infuse more science and math into our story times. This can be done by simply adding a nonfiction book to your story time lineup. 
As a bonus, studies show that when parents read nonfiction titles with their children, they actually talk to their child more and use more words. This means that you're incorporating STEAM and two early literacy practices, reading and talking. Since you probably already incorporate a craft or some free play time, why not rethink that activity and have a STEM focus as well? If you're doing a weather theme, you could talk about wind power and make pinwheels. If you just read about gardens, why not label the parts of a flower? We've explored science story time topics that included reactions and explosions, rocks and plants, stars and space, gravity, motion and magnets, and animals. We got to be chemists and we played with fizzy colored solutions like you can see in the picture there. We watched erupting elephant toothpaste. We were geologists and biologists and we examined rocks and plants with a magnifying glass. One day, we decided to be astronomers, and we laid back on the community room floor and explored the galaxy projected on the library ceiling. Finally, we tried our hands at physics and tested the principles of gravity and magnetism. It's easier than you think to do a STEAM story time. Arts and crafts programs are simple and fun for all age groups. Arts and crafts are already rich in STEAM literacy concepts. Think about it. Have you ever painted something but realized you didn't have the right colors? So first you identify a need. I have no purple paint. Then you ask a question. How do I make purple paint? Then you create a hypothesis. I can mix two colors together. And then you test your hypothesis by blending red and blue until you get the right color. You may not consciously identify those steps, but the process is there. So here are some craft programs that have very specific STEAM literacy components and some ideas for expanding on their basic ideas. Origami, by itself, involves an understanding of math and geometry that you can expand upon by using things like copper tape, LEDs, and some batteries to turn what would be a simple origami crane into a light-up paper sculpture. Derby cars. Doesn't everybody like playing with cars at some time? Either have the components and tools available or have them pre-assembled based on the age of your audience. After they decorate their cars, let them test the speed, the weight, and how far they roll. How much does it weigh? Will it go down the ramp faster or slower than a heavier car? Will it go farther? What happens if we increase the angle of the ramp? These are the kinds of questions you can ask and have the participants play to learn. Cardboard Challenge is uh, this is actually an annual global challenge that involves children in making stuff out of cardboard. Inspired by Kane's Arcade, an entire arcade made out of cardboard and duct tape, you can involve your community in making all kinds of things using all that cardboard that builds up in the library. Needle arts are also pretty heavy in math concepts, especially things like counting and pattern recognition. Find a table or some chairs somewhere in your library and start a simple club. Invite people who know how and people who want to learn, and let them teach and learn from each other. We actually developed a few Let's Learn kits with introductory tools and books for crochet and knitting, and whenever someone checks one out, we tell them about the knitting club so that they can also find support there. Roller Coaster Engineering is a simple arts and crafts program using pool noodles to simulate a roller coaster track. Run marbles down the track and see if you can challenge your patrons to make them loop the loop or corkscrew. You could also do this with uh, things like paper towel rolls. Catapults can be made from rubber bands, plastic spoons, and popsicle sticks, or scaled up and made from wood using real tools. When we make catapults with our kids, they usually get to end the event by launching ma marshmallows or pom-poms at each other. Paper airplanes are similar to origami in that they involve a lot of math and geometry skills. And you can ask questions and measure things like how far it flew, what the surface area of the wings is, how heavy it is, and you can test how small changes in the shape of the plane affect the flight path. And then tangrams, of course, are a math tool that can be used for all ages. So STEAM is everywhere, so you can easily add science to support any program, and that includes your summer reading program. So this year, the collaborative summer reading theme across the state was superheroes. So we had a superhero science program every Monday. We based the majority of these programs around a series of TED videos that, we, that explained the science behind some of the most common superhero powers. 
and whether or not they could actually work in the real world. So things like flight, super strengths, etc. So for flight, after watching these movies and then discussing if it could actually happen, we then made paper airplanes, parachutes, and learned about gravity. When we learned about space, we looked at the planets with a projector up to the ceiling using Celestia, which we talked about earlier, and then we went outside and set off a bottle rocket. For strength, we learned about shapes that are the strongest and tested the weight of books on paper and made bridges. And then, of course, we also did exercises and talked about how the body gets its strength. So some other programs um, this summer that included STEAM topics were our Defying Gravity program, where we did experiments testing our center of mass and pulled out the green screen sheet and sent kids home with a picture of them actually defying gravity, as you can see in the top photo. It's a really easy program to do. In the photo below, a Syracuse University intern did a series of programs with multiple age groups, and this one was about worms, our underground heroes. Kids got to learn about worms hands-on. It made for a great interactive low-cost program. Other programs she led included DIY hydroponics, composting, and bird watching, which all had a very high amount of participation. So now that the summer is over and we're all still recovering, next summer's theme is centered around health and wellness, and here are some ideas to inject STEAM into that program. So run a food science program. This summer at Geek Girl Camp, we had Sally Mitchell, an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow and Chemistry Teacher at East Syracuse Manoa High School, teach girls about taste. They tried pretzels, warheads, and baking soda in the back of their mouths. Their faces were priceless. So the experiment was so cool and such an easy way to learn. Patrons can also keep track of calories, water intake, exercise, and more, along with the books they are reading next summer. This combines math and science along with literacy. You can also have a math dance where kids can learn simple concepts like symmetry. And don't forget that many of us um, in the library world, we partner with community members outside in our community. So throughout the year for programs and program support, and this is extremely beneficial during the summer months when we are busy. So we might have a lot going on and we need some help. So look out to local museums, teachers, interns, and experts, like the local weathercaster, to come and run programs at the library. And you'd be surprised that none of them ask for money. So other ways that we have um, increased our STEAM in summer reading is including immersive STEAM opportunities. So we piloted Geek Girl Camp in the summer of 2014. It was five hours a day for five days straight. 44 girls were in attendance from all over the central New York area. We understood the challenges of STEM programming for girls, which include a lack of clear early pathways for girls in STEM fields, and also a lack of access to female role models in STEM. It was clear Geek Girl, Camp, Geek Girl Camp's goal was to create an early pathway to STEM by doing hands-on activities and interacting with inspiring women currently in STEM fields. We specifically targeted girls entering grades three through five. Other STEM camps for girls in our area exist, but for girls in middle and high school. Furthermore, we found that across the country there was little opportunity for this grade range. And access was limited due to lack of affordability. STEM camps can range anywhere from $100 to $800 or more per week. The cost of our camp was only $25, and that included a snack and a t-shirt. The library is a trusted place in our community, also served as the perfect setting for this camp. Without hesitation about participation from speakers, we had nine women come to the FFL or Skype in from organizations like Girls in Tech, academics from Cornell and Syracuse University, a pilot from the U.S. military, and a marketing um, employee from Facebook. We dug into our personal contacts, LinkedIn, and tech meetup events. We wanted girls to know that STEM is for everyone, and by creating this bridge to current role models, it made it evident that they could be just like them. It was one of our rules, and the most important rule of the camp, that you are going to fail, and that is okay. This not only made it easy for us when experiments didn't work, but built the confidence these young learners needed when math or science became too difficult to understand or they felt they wanted to give up. By creating this rule of it's okay to fail, no one gave up after the first try, and not one tear was shed throughout the whole camp, which with 44 girls, it's pretty good. So we wanted to create a community of young learners supporting each other through this adventure of learning STEM skills and sharing ideas. We had a Geek Girl Day on February 16th of this year, where campers and new faces reunited for a day of STEM. We had two PhD students from Syracuse University join us, and we had a Harry Potter theme that day. 
We did maglev, glow-in-the-dark, potions, and catapult experiments. We just completed our second year of Geek Girl Camp the last week in July. We had 48 campers in addition of nine counselor and trainings who were in middle and high school. This year's camp featured a field trip to the School of Computer Science and Engineering at Syracuse University. Team members from Microsoft Store from Destiny USA came to teach game design. We created pool noodle roller coasters and Skyped in with Dr. Mamta Nagaraja Patel at NASA, where we were able to ask all the questions we had about space and much more. It is our goal to continually provide STEM programming for girls so they continue to stay interested and engaged and build confidence in these areas. So from the success of our pilot year Geek Girl Camp, we found the importance and value of immersive programs. This summer, we ran a two-day superhero camp where kids created their own superhero persona. They did superhero challenges, made videos, and played superhero games. We also ran a whole day self-defense camp where families learned about how to handle bullies in the morning and did group exercises together. And then we had a local karate school come in the afternoon to teach patrons self-defense moves. So since offering these immersive opportunities, the community has asked for more. So next summer, we will be piloting a STEAM camp for boys and continue to offer full and half-day sessions of STEAM-related programs throughout the year. So lastly, let's talk about book clubs. Um, we have three book clubs that we run here in the library for three different age groups. There's an adult book club, a teen book club, and a children's book club. Uh, for the adult book club, we added a STEAM component by inviting the authors to join us for the second half of the book discussion via Skype. Um, our steampunk club is a teen book club where we read science fiction books and then we do hands-on experiments based on uh, concepts within the book. Uh, an example of this would be we read uh, From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. We talked about how mankind has actually traveled to the moon and then we shot off rockets outside the library. Books and Brownies is the children's book club where they read a lot of fiction books and then do crafts. The picture here you can see um, the Books and Brownies book club read Harry Potter and then we made wands uh, out of all kinds of different craft materials in the library. So in conclusion, incorporating STEAM into your spaces, collections, and programs doesn't require you start from scratch. Instead, look at your spaces and the way your community uses them. Find the underutilized and underappreciated spaces and turn them into destination spaces. Examine your collections and find ways to improve access to and circulation of your STEM-related materials by presenting them to your community in a new way, whether it's something like a Dewey hybrid shift, skill kits, or just incredible displays. Don't forget that your library computers and databases are also a great way to provide STEM literacy skills, and there's a lot of great free software out there. Lastly, get your captive audience attending library programs involved in STEAM learning by asking questions and modeling the way STEAM skills can be learned and utilized. If you're interested in learning more about STEAM and making, don't forget to get involved by joining the MSRT Roundtable, attending our next webinar on October 6th, or getting your hands dirty at the Making and STEAM Roundtable pre-conference session at NYLA's annual conference on October 21st. So now we'll open it up for questions. Great. Yes, thank you, everyone. I, uh, I've been keeping an eye on the uh, question pane and would uh, like to pose to the group. Um, first and foremost, uh, there was a, one of our attendees asked if the slides from this uh, session would be uh, made available. Yes, we have a slide share page and it will be available there. Um, we could send that link out to attendees. That sounds great. If that would... Okay. And I'll remind everyone that there's uh, an opportunity now as we work our way through some of the uh, questions that have come in throughout the webinar, um, that if you wanted to pose your question to our panel, you can type that into the uh, questions box that can be uh, accessed by hitting the little orange arrow on the side of your screen in that right-hand sidebar. So let's see. Um, 
I had a question um, regarding, I think it was specific to New York Public Library, but um, the, uh, the questioner asks that uh, they believe that um, outside performers were uh, requested to come from a performer's list. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the question and ask, is there um, any suggestions you would give to folks about um, talking with their administration about uh, reallocating programming funding and making that case? Hi, everybody. This is Sue. Um, Jeremy, if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, the person is concerned that there's a limited uh, uh, list that they can um, use to, to uh, find performers, or they can, they have the latitude to make the case to their administration to expand that list. Which, which, uh, I, which, I think that what they're asking, or the, the question is that in, in their particular case, there's a, a set list of performers that they're provided that they're like a menu they're allowed to choose from um, and they're wondering you know how to uh, how to make the case about using some of those programming funds for something that's not on the approved agenda Mm -hmm. I, I think a good place to start is something like today. Um, you know, gather your information and speak to your colleagues and um, uh, find those um, examples of really successful integration of different and new types of content and uh, speakers, um, both from inside and in, outside of our industry, and um, share that with your decision makers and encourage them to, to, to think differently. Uh, I know that Leah had touched a little bit on uh, the actual investiga investigation or investigatory process to look into how you are allocating funds, whether they're programming funds or collection funds, whatever it might be. Once again, I think there's a great opportunity there to uh, get your decision makers and the rest of your staff team involved in uh, understanding what is producing value today and what isn't and whether it's expanding a speaker list or reallocating funds from a collection or a, a program that no longer is bringing value to your community of users um, that conversation needs needs to happen and uh, um, I think attending something like today and, and continuing the discussion and talking to your colleagues and investigating those successful examples of integration of new and different content, et cetera, into your, into your planning and, and onto your platform is, is really important. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I have another question, and it has to do with um, outdoor spaces. Um, someone from a, a more urban environment is, is asking, how do you orchestrate doing activities outdoors and outside? Uh, do you have a, a specific designated outdoor space, um, or and how do you go about uh, securing those locations? So we are actually uh, lucky to have a pretty large side yard at the library that, and that actually was another underutilized space. It was just grass that we looked outside the window, and then finally we were like, okay, let's go play kickball out there, and let's go set off rockets, and let's go do the dirty stuff that we don't have to clean up off the carpet. Um, so we're lucky in the sense that we have that space, um, but there is a, a park that's you know right up the road that if we were to just contact the um, Parks and Rec Department and said, hey we're at the library can we hold you know a science program uh, at the park and I don't see why they wouldn't say no um, we've actually uh, we did a program last summer where um, patrons met us at Green Lake State Park so we used a state park that was down the road um, and we explored the park together uh, as a part of the library program so even if you don't actually have the green space on your property um, if there's a park down the road or five ten minutes away um, you know, I just called the woman, and she got us a parking pass set up, and we met there and ran our outdoor program. Excellent. Um, another question. How do uh, you go about getting all of your staff trained on all the new software and toys and, and gadgets that are available in the library? Sure. So we have an approach at our library where... Um, our goal, whenever possible, is to take the expertise that a particular staff member has and share it across the organization so that we're all approaching a situation as much as possible with an equal level of knowledge and, 
it doesn't necessarily require one particular staff member to be able to lead a one-on-one -on -one session on a certain technology. We all are able to do it. And our, our, the most important part of this is starting with the philosophy that technology questions are really just a different type of reference question where for us it's more about, it's not about necessarily having the personal expertise and knowledge within your own head um, to be able to do something with the technology is being able to find the answer for the person that they're looking th for through any number of resources. So a resource that you're going to pair the person with, it could be um, a, a web resource. It could be something like lynda.com or Webucator. It could be an article that you find online. It could be a book in the library. Uh, it could also be another community member. So it could also mean setting up a one-on-one -on -one appointment um, for your community member to learn SolidWorks from a mechanical engineer who volunteers their time to teach SolidWorks at the library. So, so we take a number of approaches, but a part of this system is also that we have um, monthly lunch and learn staff training opportunities. So when I mentioned getting everyone on board with a certain um, base level of knowledge with different technologies like e-readers or um, you know particular particular basics that we um, we get questions about again and again at the library. We have lunch and learn sessions that the staff members attend where they can you know test out and and take the steps they need to to get trained and um, we also have opportunities for staff to identify what should our next lunch and learn session be about. What could I use a refresher in? Um, what types of questions do I sometimes struggle with? So we get together as a staff team, identify the topics for the lunch and learns, and then do, do that training together on a monthly basis. Excellent. Um... Can someone comment about uh, your activities, the question uh, and, and promotion? So it's, um, the question was, how do you market your new programs and collections? And did you ramp up to the level where you are, or did you start off with uh, low participation? Um, in, in terms of marketing and promoting any uh, library services, whether they're new or existing, we place as much value on uh, the time and the resources that we spend in that direction as we do with creating the program in the first place. So here we made a conscious decision several years ago to develop um, the capacity within our budget to have a marketing professional. Um, on, on the team. And this position or this particular person functions as a member of the professional team and uh, participates in the forums and the planning sessions that Leah was just um, describing for you so that she, uh, this marketing promotions professional, is um, involved with all development and, and uh, understands from the conception of programs and services, what our goals are and what our hope for outcomes are. So that person can put together the correct and appropriate and farthest reaching uh, marketing and promotions to plan so that we can build awareness uh, beyond um, the users whose attention we have already captured. So uh, that's um, systematic uh, across the board with all of our programming and all of our services. Um, we're uh, equally committed to uh, promoting and um, uh, marketing as we are to, to creating new opportunities for, for our patrons. And the second half of that question, Jeremy? Uh, when you first rolled out this type of programming, uh, did it start with a bang or did it take some time to, to build up and, and how did you adjust for, for um, well, how, how was it in the beginning? Well, um, with, with STEAM programming, once again, uh, we started um, uh, with making many, many years ago um, uh, informally and um, more mobily uh, back in about 2011. And um, then in around 2012, 2013, we um, started de developing dedicated spaces due to the uh, um, overwhelming um, uh, positive response and at the request of our community who were excited about the new opportunities that they were experiencing and were interested in more. 
And through that process with making, it was a very natural kind of progression to, for us to begin to understand that what we were supporting um, through making was uh, STEM, STEM learning here in the library. So uh, as we began to um, recognize that, and begin, began to look deep into our existing programs and collections and services and how we allocate resources, we started to make conscious decisions about uh, focusing uh, more closely on integrating STEM into everything that we do um, at every level for every demographic across the organization. So when we began to move down that path of integrating STEM into our existing programming, um, we already had an audience um, that we had identified as uh, those who, who would respond um, um, to that type of programming. And then, of course, as we began to build momentum and, um, a, and a base for, for, this type, for these types of opportunities um, through promotions and marketing and just the, the, the sheer excitement that grew in our community around these new and exciting opportunities, um, uh, we, we had a uh, um, no particular challenges in um, uh, uh, watching the attendance and the participation grow. Certainly along the way, there might be particular STEM um, sessions or classes or um, opportunities that didn't quite hit the mark. And so like with anything else that we do, um, uh, that we present to the public, um, and we had to go back and assess uh, what are the reasons why uh, Program X uh, had low attendance or um, didn't capture the type of audience necessarily that we were looking for. And more often than not, what we find is what I'm sure all of you find is um, it's not necessarily the content that needs to change or the program isn't uh, not necessarily not a good idea. It's um, all those factors that sometimes are out of our control. It might be uh, it might be the language that we're using when we're promoting that particular uh, uh, learning opportunity or participation opportunity. Maybe uh, people don't understand what it is. Uh, maybe uh, it's the timing, the time of day, the time of week, the time of year. So uh, all of that, those questions that we ask ourselves with any type of programming, uh, we have to continually ask ourselves with, with, the, with the STEM opportunities. And I can't stress how important it is to um, make it a priority to do consistent and ongoing assessment of, of every program. Um, because uh, if, if you don't, uh, you, you're not going to be, you're not going to be informed and you're not going to learn from your, from your experiences. So uh, both informal and formal assessment is really critical. Thank you. Uh, the, the last question that we have in the queue, and we're, we're coming up on our time, was uh, regarding your partnerships uh, with school libraries and uh, whether you, you have those partnerships in place and, and how those are working. Um, asked by a uh, school librarian who is about to uh, kick off a makerspace within their, their uh, school library in a couple of weeks. So we, uh, we work with the school libraries, but also work with the teachers as well. Um, so we try to work with everybody um, because I know that some school librarians do get super overwhelmed because you're seeing everybody. So, um, you know, we try to work with everybody in the school. Um, so when we work with the school libraries um, and teachers, we give them extended loan periods. Um, all of our STEM kits, so whether it's the Makey Makeys, the Little Bits, um, we will let educators um, check those items out. Um, so that's definitely something as a school librarian, talk to your public librarians about um, because, you know, budgets are different in, in schools and in public libraries um, and they might have something that you can use in the classroom. Um, so if you start that discussion with your public librarian, you'll be able to borrow um, those items. So teachers, the school librarian, um, they borrow stuff from us all the time. Um, we always make sure, um, you know, we talk probably in about April about our summer reading program. Uh, you know, we go in, we talk to every single class. Um, we also work with the teachers to have the kids come to the library as well because um, some of them are visual learners and want to see the actual stuff. Um, so we work very well in making sure that kids are coming to the public library over the summer. Um, so throughout the year we'll work on book lists together um, and really it's just making sure the school librarians know that we're their best resource. So if they need help assisting with um, a lesson or with their collections or they're you know reading something and they need additional copies um, we make sure that that communication is open um, so the school librarian can seamlessly get things done 
Excellent. Well, I, I uh, extend the thanks of everyone that was on today's webinar to the panel for a fantastic webinar and wonderful information. And uh, thank you all for uh, taking time to participate. Uh, that concludes today's webinar, and we hope that we will see you on our next webinar and uh, at the NILA conference.